Welcome to the Build Your Life Coaching Biz podcast, where you get to learn how to become a professional life coach and start an online coaching business from scratch. I'm your host, Krista Kathleen, a professional certified coach and spiritual business mentor. In 2016, I got divorced and left my full-time job as a registered nurse and decided to bravely answer my calling of becoming a life coach so I could help to change lives as I traveled around the world. And now I want to help you discover your purpose too. Having the freedom and flexibility to be your own boss and make as much money as you want right from your laptop will be one of the best gifts you ever give to yourself, your family, and the world. In these episodes, I'll give you real coaching combined with proven strategies and spiritual practices in order to help build your dream coaching business that feels perfect for you. I have a special guest for all of you today. I'm really excited because I haven't, uh, other than Rochelle, who is our scholarship winner for the Born to Coach Training Academy, I haven't brought a guest onto the podcast for a long time. So I'm really excited about this. So Monica Hutchinson is going to be our guest speaker today. And we are talking all about feedback, giving feedback, receiving feedback. And this can apply to, you know, personal relationships, your coaching business, your full-time job, like just anywhere in life. And Monica has been the one that has taught me everything to know about feedback, and it's been so valuable, and I'm so grateful for everything that she's taught me. So you guys are going to get so much out of this podcast today. And before we dive into our topic, I just want to share with you all how I know Monica, and then also let Monica introduce herself as well. And so Monica, correct me if there's anything that I get are off or wrong here because we have so much we have so much history together and <laughs> we have like so many roles that overlap because you're one of my best friends now and there was a time where I was your personal coach and then I think I was your coach trainer when mm-hmm. I was coaching for the other coaching company and then we were business partners at one time and we started a company called Fearless Public Speaking and we ran retreats and public speaking group programs. And so, yeah, we've just, we've done a lot in the past couple of years and you're just like, you're one of my, my people at the end of the day. And um, I've, I've just learned so much from you and yeah, so I'm going to pause there, but I I would love for you to introduce yourself, Monica. Sounds good. Thanks for that, Krista. So like Krista said, I'm Monica. I've known Krista, gosh, it's been, it has to be like five years, five, six years now, which is just wild if you think about it, time flies so much. Um, But I I have kind of meandered along my path a lot. So uh, when Krista first met me, I was going through a divorce And I was thinking about leaving my corporate job. And so I stepped into the life coaching world for a bit, ran my own business for a little bit. And then uh, from there, I've gone back into the corporate space, but I've worked in training for the past 11 years and uh, specifically with management, coaching skills, leadership, strength, space approach, all of that stuff is, is kind of what makes me really happy. Presentation skills, public speaking, all of that. And that's where Krista and I really connected when we created our programs around fearless public speaking. Um, I kind of dabble still in the coaching world. I partnered with Krista on some of her programs and also uh, around the subject of feedback a lot of the time. And then I also just published a book called Worthless Slut. It's available on Amazon about my own life. If any of you have read Krista's book, Beyond the White Picket Fence, very kind of similar in theme of the things that I've gone through as well. So I can add author to my Uh, list of titles now. Yes. Yes. I forgot that we both wrote (laughs) books that are, we're both of us are naked on the covers of our books. (laughs) (laughs) And we just like put our full raw authentic story out there as a way to, you know, help make the world a better place and let people know that they're not alone in their own struggles. And I, I don't have too many friends who've you know, done something as brave and as bold as that. So that's also another thing that, yeah, really connects us. And um, also, I forgot to tell you all as well, I just hired Monica to be my training consultant for the Born to Coach Training Academy. And because she's so good at 
creating and facilitating training programs for companies. And so she's really been helping me to upgrade my training content in my academy. So we're working together again on a professional level, which makes my heart so happy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and if anyone is curious, Monica is located in Denver, Colorado right now, and I'm in St. Louis. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk all about feedback and we actually wanted to record this episode a while ago. I don't know if it was like six months ago or a year ago. It's been a it's, bit. It's been a bit. And for some reason, it just didn't feel right to record it at the time. But recently, I received some feedback in my Born to Coach Training Academy from my students. And so it reignited the spark for me to want to talk about feedback again, uh, because it's it's such a normal part of everyday life. And whether we know it or not, we're always giving and we're always receiving feedback. And for the coaches who are listening here on the podcast, when you all start working with your own coaching clients and, and maybe you create like group coaching programs or you do retreats or workshops, feedback is going to be such an important part of that process. And even when you go through coach training as well, well, if you decide to go through coach training, I hope you do, but at least in my program, in the Born to Coach Training Academy, we do so much feedback, you know, listening to your coaching calls and, um, you know, just watching you coach live and, and feedback is such a great way to, you know, get better as a coach and to learn what you're doing well at and what you keep improving on. So yeah, feedback is just, it's such an important part of becoming a coach, running a successful business and just so many areas of life. So uh, is there anything that you want to at least add to that, Monica? I think it's one of those things that a lot of people have an edge about too, especially yeah. getting feedback or even giving it because we want to be nice. We don't want to upset other people. And Chris and I talk about this all the time. <laughs> We've both dealt with that ourselves, but I really think it's so crucial and it's such a good life skill to know both how to receive it graciously and also to give it in a way that people can at least sit with it. And even, you know, they don't have to accept it, but they can at least uh, listen to it and hear from where you're coming from and have a conversation with you. Uh, but people are just so edgy about feedback a lot of times because it hasn't come at us always in the most helpful of ways when we were younger, maybe. And so I think it's just such a good idea to understand your own relationship with it and how you can get to a place of just being more accepting on either side. Yeah, that's true. And I had a student in my first class in the academy, and she was really scared to receive feedback. And I was questioning her about that. And she said in her full time day job that the feedback was used like as a weapon. Mm. And so I, I do think that if there's like some of us that don't have a good relationship with feedback out there, that that may have happened where, mm -hmm. yeah, we didn't have a good experience with receiving feedback and it got misused in a way. And uh, so that's like one of my favorite questions. And I actually learned this from you, Monica, is like asking people, like, how do you like to receive feedback? Because I know for me personally, like I need very gentle feedback. Like mm -hmm. do not be direct with me. Do not be aggressive because I will shut down and yes. you can even get your feedback into my brain. Um, so like, I know that if someone, and I tell this to my partner, Kyle all the time, cause like he'll be gone all day and he'll come home. And I've been like, you know, doing the stay at home mom thing and trying to clean the house and he'll come home and be like, the kitchen's a mess. Like, <laughs> Why did you let the kitchen get like this? And like, I cannot be with that kind of feedback. I mm. need acknowledgement first. I know that about myself of like, hey, I know you've probably been really busy all day, like taking care of our son. And I'm just curious, like, how did the kitchen get this messy here? I don't know, Manica, how do you like to receive feedback? So funny. I'm similar. Krista, you and I are, we're such a good pairing because we're similar in so many ways, but we're also really different in a lot of ways. And I'm sure all of you will hear that as we talk more, but I'm very similar with the acknowledgement. Um, I also, I was in a marriage for over a decade where it always felt like all I ever heard was what I did wrong. 
And even when I would ask about that, it would be uh, for my ex-husband would tell me, well, if you're, if I don't tell you, you know, that you're doing something right, just assume that you're doing it right. But then all you hear is the negative stuff. And the truth is we need to hear positive feedback as well to know what we're doing right to reinforce those behaviors that people like. And people often forget that because they just think that you, you already know what you're doing right because you're not hearing about it. But when we only hear negative feedback, then that's all we sit with. And we think that we're bad or wrong or that we're doing a bad job in life because all we hear about is the negative stuff. So I'm the same way as you. I like it to be a little more gentle. Uh, I think permission is important. And Chris and I have talked about that a lot over time is wherever possible asking permission to give feedback because sometimes people aren't in the right headspace and that's okay. If someone tells you I'm not in the space to receive this right now, I think it's okay to say, okay, well let's set up a time to Mm -hmm. talk later about this so that we can both be prepared for that conversation. But it was a, an old boss of mine that the first day he started on the job, sat down next to me and said, I'm, I'm not here for you to work for me. I'm here to understand how you best work with me um, or how I can best work with you. And he asked me that question, how do you like to receive feedback? And it just took me aback because no one had ever asked me that before. So I think it's a fair question to ask yourself in case anyone ever asks you. But also when you're working with clients or your partners or whoever it is that you're talking to in life, this works for anything in life. Where can you ask them? How do you like to receive feedback? And then try and honor that as much as possible. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up that permission piece. That is really powerful. And again, I think I learned that from you. And it's even something I started doing in the coach training academy as well. And like, something that I do is I do six observed coaching calls for each student. And at the end of the call, I do 10 minutes of like constructive feedback. And they know it's coming. And I always tell them at the beginning, but even before I start to go in the feedback, like I always just ask them, is it okay to give you some feedback around this right now? Like, I just think, I just think that's so important. So that way they're open and they're receptive and they feel respected and they trust that like, I'm going to give it in a way that again, it's not going to be used as a weapon or attack them in any way. And so I'm sure I can get so much better about it, but I have been trying to be really good about asking for permission first. And yeah, I did learn that from you, Monica. Yeah, that's really important, the permission piece. And I know Chris and I will probably talk more about this here shortly. Um, the idea of you can't always get permission or give permission and that. sometimes handling it is a little more challenging when you're not like when someone doesn't ask you for permission, but when you're able to asking that permission, even if it's positive feedback, asking people what mindset they're in and are they able to receive feedback? Because some people, this is why it's all also powerful to ask them how they like to receive feedback, because some people don't want to be publicly recognized. Maybe if you have a group program and you want to praise someone and give them positive feedback, they might not like positive recognition in front of people too. So it's just such a great question to ask, especially if you're going to spend time with, with people in a a longer relationship, whatever that looks like, just to understand what they need and try to cater to that. And it just allows them to be so much more receptive and hopefully to feel safe to give you feedback when they're in a place to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So from what you were just saying, it totally jogged my memory. And I remember when we were going to originally do <laughs> the feedback podcast, and it was after mm-hmm. I did the peyote ceremony. And I was telling you about the shaman mm-hmm. that led the ceremony. And he was going, we were all like in such a vulnerable place from just doing the plant medicine for two days. And our hearts were just wide open from the medicine. And then he started going around the group and like, kind of like giving his, his like, observations of each person saying like, well, I see you doing this and this and this and this. And when he started telling me something like some patterns that I had coming up, I could definitely see that there was truth in what he was saying, but I just was not like ready to have, like you said, that public feedback in that way. And I was so upset and I got so defensive and I shut down and I wish he would have just said like, hey, can I just share some observations with you that I noticed that have come up over the weekend? 
Uh-huh. You know, if like he would have just said that, I think I would have been in a much recept- more receptive place. And then after that too, that something that's really important to do. And I think I may have learned this from you, Monica, or, or, you know, my coach training skills somewhere, but like, then you always want to give the person a chance to like confirm it or add their thoughts afterwards too. Right. Like, cause he, he just like, said it and then it was just like it was the absolute truth and the fact like it was a fact and like at the end of the day it was his feedback it was his observation so I would have loved for him to been like okay Krista like you know he says his thing okay so what are you hearing in that or or what are your thoughts around that and then I could have like rejected it or I could have been like "Mm, I don't know if I agree with that but so I just really felt like like my voice got taken away in that situation (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's, you and I have talked about this before, but I I have kind of a formula for giving feedback. And it it was that piece that you're talking about asking for input is so important. So Mm -hmm. with giving feedback, my structure is threefold. It's acknowledge the person, provide the insight, and then ask for input. And Mm -hmm. so basically, you, you all have probably heard of the feedback sandwich, where it's like something good, and then something construction or constructive, and then something good and that I think is a load of crap because it just people know what's coming they're just waiting for the bad stuff and then it just feels sort of dismissive about anything in the middle it kind of tries to soften things but with the method that I like to use is you're acknowledging the person for where they're at that may be something positive they did or it may just be hey I know you as a person are such a good person you've got a big heart and I wanted to just give you this piece of information that I noticed and then providing the insight in as concrete a verbiage as possible. And what I mean by that is not subjective, like I think or I feel or you you make me feel this way. It's more about this is what I observed ob- objectively. Like this is what I saw, this is what I heard, whatever. And then you can give your opinion on that, but stating it as th- this is what I am getting out of this and then asking for input. What are you hearing from me? Or what does this bring up for you? And this works for any relationship, right? I mean, I work in the corporate world. I think it works in the corporate world as well as it does in coaching or personal relationships or anything, because I think that piece of checking for understanding is something that's messed or missed so many times. And without that, you don't allow for people to get out of that space of potential defensiveness, which I know Krista and I both struggle with sometimes with someone coming at us really pointedly. But if someone asks you for your insight, it sort of takes you out of that place of defense and you get to express yourself and that can change the whole conversation. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, thank you for sharing with the audience your feedback formula and I still use it all the time. So I hope that (laughs) for anyone listening, if you're going to take away like one thing, one valuable thing from this podcast that you take away that feedback formula, because like I said, I still use it every day, all the time, Mm -hmm. so many different situations. And then Monica, you recommended this book to me, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, I'm currently in the middle of it, but I, there is a chapter that was all about when you're giving feedback, make it as like objective or like observations versus like, this is what I think, or this is what I feel. So that's right. something that I'm really learning how to differentiate as well. So it's that a challenge. Me. It is. It really is. Yeah. But it's useful. <sighs> yes. Yes. So if anyone wants a book to read, um, if you just want to become a better communicator and you want to make sure that you're using nonviolent communication. I really recommend this book. It has been so incredible so far. Um, Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is as I, okay. So when you, and you know this Monica, because you've created your own programs with your coaching business, but so Mm -hmm. when you start to create your programs, you get really attached to your programs and, and even with your own book, right? And it becomes like your baby and you put so much just like money and time and blood and sweat and tears and soul into your projects. And then, and then you can think that everybody is going to love it and that everybody is going to see it in the same way as you do. And, and, or at least this is how I 
used to think about things. And then when someone starts complaining or starts criticizing or giving feedback, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, what's going on here? This thing that I created is like, it's perfect. It's amazing. (laughs) It's incredible. But then I've started to realize that like, no, like you're not going to make everyone happy. Everyone's always going to have an opinion and, you know, sometimes they're going to want to be vocal about it and it can be really like maybe devastating if you're not like mentally prepared for that. So do you have any like thoughts around that? Well, first of all, something I learned a while ago, and this was somewhere in my corporate life, was that if someone gives you feedback, it means they haven't given up on you yet. So it's actually a really positive thing. Because at the point that people give up on you and they don't care anymore, they're going to stop giving you feedback. They're going to go bitch about it somewhere else, but they're not going to talk to you personally about it. And so I think that if, if we can all remind ourselves of that when someone comes at us with feedback is asking ourselves, okay, what, what is this trying to provide for me? Where are they coming from in this situation? How might this be able to help me? And just kind of separating yourself from it and also asking yourself, how would I want to be received if I were in this situation? Chris and I, I know both are really big on acknowledging people for where they're at. And it takes a lot of courage for people, especially women, I feel like, um, or, or those who identify as women, it takes a lot of courage to give feedback and to even come forward because a lot of people feel like it's got to be a difficult conversation. And so, you know, I always say that the one correct response to feedback is thank you. And if you're in a place too where someone comes at you hot with feedback and you're not prepared to receive it, it is 100% okay to say, thank you for the feedback. I'm going to need some time to process this and to leave it at that point. You can tell them you'll follow up with them or whatever that may be. But sometimes, especially if you're someone who you know it's going to hit you hard and you want to show up as presently as possible, it's totally okay. Even if you're on a call and someone's requested time with you to talk about it, it's totally okay for you to say, you know what, thank you for this feedback. I'm going to need some time to internalize this. Let me set up some follow-up time with you once I've had a chance to process this. And then, you know, I can show up for you at my best then and we can discuss where to go from there. But I think we also all have been conditioned so much that like feedback means we have to do something with it or we have to make changes. And Chris and I've talked about that a lot too, because when someone's coming at you with a bunch of feedback, you're like, oh my God, how do I change everything and make everyone happy? The bottom line is you can't, you never will, you know, and you, you kind of have to look at and prioritize. And this is some of what Krista and I've been doing lately with um, me doing some consulting for her on her business is let's prioritize what are thematically the things that are coming out of this and what what's the biggest bang for our buck to start with what's going to be the easy low hanging fruit that we can take and make some changes that will have heavy impact up front and then from there what are nice to haves not need to haves and also as a program owner or someone who is providing services to other remember you do get the final say you don't ever have to make changes it's ultimately up to you what you decide to incorporate and what you don't. So I think coming at it with that mindset of, hey, I can receive this. It doesn't mean anything bad about me, which is another big thing. I think many of us who have internal wounds around, you know, worthiness and uh, just feeling like we do things wrong all the time. If feedback comes at us, we really tend to internalize that and tell ourselves some pretty bad stories But just taking that step back and saying, you know what, this is about their experience and I'm going to look at it a little bit more objectively and and try and see what I can pull from it. But give yourself space too, because space is important, especially if you know you're someone who you're not going to be able to provide good conversation up front. That's totally okay. Yeah. And and for people who identify as perfectionist and recovering people pleasers like myself, it, it is really challenging receiving feedback because at least like, you know, I can only speak from my own experience, but like when I had a couple of students email me and they gave me like a very long list of feedback and, and the ideas were, they're really great. Uh, but the first thing, like kind of my first initial thoughts when I was reviewing that feedback, I was like, oh my gosh, like I 
designed a crappy program and I'm a terrible person and <laughs> right. I, I can't make these people, I, you know, I'm like hurting these people and I can't make these people happy. And like, it, man, it just really sent me like in a spiral. And then I know I like, I think I messaged you right away and I was like, oh my gosh, I got all this feedback and I'm so overwhelmed and I don't even know where to begin. And I, I felt like this like urgency of like, I had to start implementing it right away. And if I didn't, then I was a bad coach trainer. And, mm. and so, you know, you really helped me to remember that first of all, like I'm, I'm in charge here. I'm in control and I can filter through like what's going to be useful and what's going to be helpful for me. And, mm. And take some time to sit with it and decide, you know, if and how I want to implement the feedback and, and that I didn't have to implement everything. And uh, so I really appreciate you like just grounding me with that. And I can imagine for like anyone who's listening to this, you know, like, you know it'll, it'll be just some, it'll be a matter of time with your own clients. <laughs> you know, again, one-on-one -on -one clients or group clients where they're also going to want to share ideas with you and, and give feedback. And, you know, hopefully it doesn't send you down a spiral like it did with me and that this podcast can help you to remember like, okay. And, and even just going back to Monica's formula, like, okay, thank you for that feedback. And I love what you said earlier too, of like, it's, they're also doing this because they care. Mm -hmm. They care about the program. They care, they care about like the future of it and they want to see it go in a positive direction. And so I think it's like a good idea to just kind of like maybe take a step back and breathe and coach yourself through it. Or if you are working with a therapist or a coach or a mentor, maybe like, uh, that's what I love that you do with me as well. Monica is like, anytime that I get feedback, you always take the time to like process and debrief with me mm. on that too. And that's been so helpful for me. And you do the same for me too, <laughs> which is very helpful as well, because, you know, I, it's like anything, you can be an expert in anything and you can preach this stuff all day and you're still going to falter. None of us are experts. We're all human. And in the end, we still need people, coaches, friends who are going to gut check us. But I think Krista, you and I talking about these over time has helped us hold each other accountable in these situations, both personal and professional um, where we can hold that space for each other, but we can also gut check on like, okay, this is what, what I'm hearing from this. It's a little bit different, but also acknowledge where the other person is because remember your feelings are always valid. It's totally okay to feel whatever it is that you feel just like, it's totally okay for people who are giving you feedback to feel what they feel. And then, you know, we just have to figure out where to go from there in a way that's going to serve us best and, and hopefully serve our clients best, knowing that we can't give everyone everything that they want. Right. I remember you and I talked about this when we led one of our public speaking retreats and we had gotten a lot of feedback during that retreat and we were like, okay, like we don't have to implement all of this. And we were like talking ourselves through it. And, uh, cause yeah, there was that side of us that was like, okay, we need to do, we need to like drop everything and make these people happy. And that's not what you have to do with that. You'll drive yourself up the wall if you spend your whole life doing that. And I think a lot of us do that is we want to make everyone happy. We want, because we care, right? We want people yeah. to be happy with everything, but everyone is different. And so everyone's needs are different. And so we can't accommodate everything for everyone. We can do the best with what we have. And then when people express needs or give us feedback, it is okay also to use that formula back with them to say, you know, I really appreciate you giving me this feedback here's what I'm hearing. And here's the feedback I have back on why we are not going to be incorporating this and then give them a chance to express their feelings from there. And that's okay too. It, it kind of works going back and forth. Mm, that's so good. That's so good. And yeah, you know, you're right. We can't make everyone happy because someone's going to be like, I want more of this. And then someone else is going to be like, I want less of this. Yeah. Right. Like <laughs> I remember when I went through my hypnotherapy training a couple years ago and we were at the instructor's house in Seattle. And I, I think I literally messaged you during the training. I was like, Oh my gosh, like this woman, I, I love her to death. She's so talented, but she spent like eight hours just talking at us, like uh. we're sitting on the floor <laughs> and she's sitting in the middle of our circle. And she just like talked and talked and talked. And like my ADHD brain cannot handle that at all. And I was so mad and I was so upset 
because like I could only like absorb like maybe 30 minutes of what she was mm-hmm. before I totally like just was so overwhelmed and you know I was like why is she why is she doing this to us and I remember like talking to one of the other coaches that was um, in the program with me and I was like do you feel like like there's just so much information that's being given and maybe this should be a little bit more of like a back and forth conversation or training. And she's like, Oh no, I love the way the instructors teaching us right now. And she's like, I'm just like, I, I'm just like eating popcorn and soaking it all up. And so, <laughs> you know, like that we were having two completely different experiences. Mm-hmm. There, right. And if we would have both given her feedback, the feedback would have been completely contradictory. Different. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's different that's learning like, styles. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, I had some of my students give me feedback. And so it was just like, really confusing for me, because it was like, yeah, one person was like, I want, I want you to do more and more of this. And then another person was like, Chris, I want you to do less of this. And I'm like, well, shoot, like, now I don't, <laughs> what do I do with that? I don't know. And I just started to realize like, yeah, you just, so how would you handle that, Monica? Like, if, if someone's giving you like conflicting feedback like that, what, what's like the middle ground there? The hard thing is there's not always a middle ground. I think it depends on what kind of situation you're in. If you're in a group setting like that, that's where if you're getting conflicting feedback, it might be worthwhile to more broadly poll your group, maybe in a a Google form or a survey or something like that, just to ask what people are thinking, because then you, you can kind of push the feedback one way or another to allow you to see more thematically what's happening because it's really hard if you have one person versus one person then it's just one on one but if you have more people leaning one way or the other then you have more information to be able to try and make a decision if it's just you you might have to dig in with that individual person on what's really at the heart of this. What are you not getting out of it? And you may have to make a decision based on your own resourcing, your own capabilities, but then it may become a conversation with that person, letting them know why you're not making the change, but also asking them those questions about what is it that you're not getting? And are there other ways that, that you can find support that will give you what you need when in the absence of us being able to make this change that you asked for. And people appreciate that. Just feeling heard is more important. You probably read that in that nonviolent communication book. The feeling heard part is the most important part of it. It's just letting people know that you care, you're listening, you've considered what they said. And people understand that we can't make every change for everyone, but it's a matter of was something done with their feedback and that something done could just be, you considered it and you looked into the options, you weighed the options. So then it's just a matter of having conversation with them, at least giving them some validation and seeing how you can support them outside of that. And that sounds like a lot of work, but in the end it's worth it because they'll still be checked in with you. They will have built more trust with you and they'll feel heard And that's going to keep them moving on the same path with you instead of moving in a different direction. Yeah, it can definitely be a lot of energy and work, (laughs) but in the end, it is worth it. And you're right. Most of the time, it's just the person wants to be heard in some Mm -hmm. way, even if you don't end up using the feedback or you can't. So that's a good reminder. So, okay, what is the difference between like feedback and criticism. And I I was going to ask you earlier too, like kind of what is the definition of feedback? Maybe we should start there and go into like, yeah, what's the difference between feedback and criticism or like venting, complaining, et cetera. I don't know that I have like a textbook definition of feedback. I mean, I could Google it real fast, but I would in, in general, feedback is just a mechanism for literally, if you think about the words feeding back, I'm feeding something back to you feeding information back to you. It could be positive. It could be negative. Uh, it, it can take on any different nature, but essentially I'm feeding back something to you based on what I've seen, heard, felt, anything like that. Chris and I have talked a lot about, you know, criticism versus venting versus things like that. And I think it depends on intent has a lot to do with it because just straight criticism sometimes doesn't have the intent of exploring and and helping someone. It's just, let me just critique everything that you did. And to me, criticism just feels 
like it has more negative connotation to it. A lot of people may not agree with that or they may not feel like that when they're giving criticism, but I feel like criticism can be a little bit synonymous with feedback, but that it often doesn't necessarily have the intent of, you know, I'm giving this to you from a positive mindset. And then venting, often venting is just, I just need to be heard. It's I need to complain about something or I need to tell you about a situation and I just need to be heard. I need to be able to say the things in as raw of a form as possible. And I just need to be heard. But that's where I've heard from a lot of people. And we've talked about this before, Krista, too. And I think you taught me this question or you've asked me this question before when I've been in a place of venting is like, what do you need from me right now? Do you need me to just listen? Do you need acknowledgement? Do you need, uh, you know, criticism? Do you need support? Do you need me to go kick someone's ass? You know, whatever it is, what is it that you need from me right now? This question works really good with significant others too, I feel like, because I've seen um, one of my partners has been asking me that more lately. And it was funny, he asked me yesterday, I was like, I don't know, but I really appreciated him asking me at least and taking the time instead of just trying to fix it for me. So I think that that question is really helpful. I love that question. I use it all the time. Yeah. With with friends, with family, partners, with my coaching clients. Like, yeah, if they're just like dumping a lot of information or venting and I'll just like check in and be like, okay, yeah, like how do you need me to show up for you right now in this moment? Or yeah, what do you need from me? Because it can be really like confusing and overwhelming when yeah, you're getting a lot of a lot of venting. So uh, I, I feel like when you ask that question, it really kind of like stops the person in their tracks and they're, and they may even be like, Oh, wow. Wow. I didn't realize I was coming off like this or I didn't realize I was venting. And then it kind of just helps them to get like to gather themselves and their thoughts and be like, okay, this is actually what I need. So um, just for anyone listening right now, if you have, uh, if you do a, a one-on-one session when you're a coaching client and you're like, okay, how can I best support you today? Or whatever you ask to open up the coaching session and they just start like, yeah, just venting about their day, which will very easily happen to you if it hasn't happened yet. And then you can, you know, jump, you know, maybe give them like five minutes, 10 minutes to just kind of like verbal diarrhea to like (laughs) empty their mind. That's that 10 minutes is usually like my boundaries around that. And then I'll just say like, okay, so like, how can I best show up for you in this moment? Or what do you really need out of this session today? And then that really, yeah, really helps the person. So it's a pretty powerful question. You and I, Krista, were just talking about too, where you, if you have friends or you have, whether it's friends or clients or anyone, this works great with personal relationships too. If you have someone, you just feel like they're an energy suck on you and you feel like you sit in this space a lot of providing them a lot of empathy if they're complaining a lot and we want to be there for our friends and family and everything but especially if you're a really sensitive person you start to just get this heaviness about you and your energy gets so drained and so we were talking about using this kind of question with those people to start checking in when you start feeling that pattern before it gets to the point where you feel like your energy is completely sucked dry just to be like okay what do you actually need from me right now because then it puts you at choice to decide do I want to engage in this way or do I need to put down a boundary and say, okay, I I really can't provide much more right now. Like I don't have the spoons, the energy, however, whatever words work for you um, to show up for you in this way right now. And that's okay too. Yeah. I heard from like a coaching book or a past mentor or something that like when you're the one asking the questions, then you take back control of the conversation. Yeah. So I think, yeah, by asking that question, you're, you're regaining control, essentially. Yep. So, yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so let's talk about like how to give safe and constructive feedback versus ineffective feedback. I would love to like give some actual tangible examples for our audience so they can really understand what the difference is between the two and how they sound. Yeah, so this is where concrete language is really important. A lot of us tend to just say like, 
you did this thing and it made me feel this way. And that's such offensive language that that nonviolent communication book really goes into detail on this. But it, it's really offensive language if you think about it and you think about how defensive people get and they feel like they have to defend themselves because they feel verbally attacked. And so it's it's taking a step back and objectively saying, okay, this is what happened. You know, let's say my, my partner didn't acknowledge me in a way that I, I needed them to. And it's like, you know, when I shared this situation that was going on with me and you said this one thing, I felt invalidated or that book has such a great list of feelings too, because none of us are great at using feeling words either. They say, what was it? They said, if you, if you can use the word, I think, or, um, like I feel before it and you can't just use the word itself, then you're probably not speaking a feeling, you're speaking a thought or you're speaking like a state of being. So that's one that I'm still working on is using more feeling words because there's so many great feeling words out there that we don't use. But getting in touch with what you're actually feeling and what you're actually meaning and being able to say, this is what happened uh, as a result, I felt this thing, not saying you made me feel right, because we, our feelings are our own. It doesn't mean that other people don't influence them. I don't like when people say like you, you choose how you feel about things. I don't know that we always choose the feelings we immediately have about something. We innately feel certain things based on our patterns and what we've experienced. And that's okay. Um, you know, it's not like we're making a conscious choice to feel these things, but at the same time, own the fact that this is your feeling that you had based on what happened. And then from there, uh, it, it's about figuring out what you need in that moment. Like, is it, do you need acknowledgement? And if you do, what does that look like? Or again, going back to that formula from before opening the conversation on what was going through your mind when you said or did this thing and allowing for them to come back and have a conversation as opposed to just being very accusatory with uh, what happened. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, as you were talking, I was thinking about another example. So like, say for some, say that someone comes up to you and is like, I don't like your program, or I don't mm -hmm. feel like it's working. Like that's, mm -hmm. you would, con that would be considered very ineffective feedback, right? Yeah, because it's generalized. And Kristen, I talk about this all the time, right? So I, I was a manager in the corporate world a while back. And I remember if I have people come to me and give me feedback about people on my team, and I'd be like, okay, give me an example of when this happened. Like, what was a specific instance? If they'd be like, well, Joe was rude to me. And I'm like, cool. So tell me about a time when Joe was rude to you. What did that look like? And if they're just like, well, no, he's just rude overall. I would tell them, I'm not going to give that feedback to that person because it's not useful. How do you feel if someone comes to you with some general thing and be like, you know, Krista, you're too sensitive. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> what information has informed this assessment they've made of you? If someone told me, well, Joe was on this call and he made this remark um, that was very harsh. These were the words he used. And, and this is the tone that was used and everything. And it was very ineffective. And this is the result that it had then I'm able to go back to that person and say, okay, this is what actually happened in specific terms. So when, when you're giving feedback, as in when you're receiving, you want it to be specific. So if someone comes to you and says, I don't like your program, I think that's where you can pause and say, okay, thank you for that feedback. Can you give me some specific examples of things within the program that you're struggling with right now? Mm -hmm. And if they can't at that moment, then that's where you want to pause and say, you know, I really want to be receptive to this. Uh, it would be helpful for us to come back together and have you come up with some specific examples of what it is that you're struggling with and, and what it is about those particular things that's causing you to struggle. And then let's have a real conversation because that's where you can get meaty with talking about what's going on. It may not even be what they think it is. It might not be the program itself. It might be that something was said by a student in your class that threw them off and, and they need to feel acknowledged on that and just have that address. You never know what it is behind the scenes, but people often use vast generalizations so that they don't have to sit with those feelings of what's actually going on. So asking for those specifics is super important. Okay. So yeah, what I'm hearing is like more generalized type of feedback is going to be very ineffective. Yeah. And when you're asking the person for like specific examples, 
to me, it's like you're making them take responsibility for yep. their feedback. Because, exactly. Yeah, because it, 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 it's not fair to just go up to someone and say like, yeah, you're too sensitive. I don't like your program. Like, because obviously you haven't taken the time to really like sit with it and say, mm-hmm. what is it that I'm unhappy about here or how am I feeling? And so you're right that so that is the per- other person's job to say like, yeah, okay, so I'm so I'm hearing you're not happy, but I yeah, I need you to give me specific examples. And then then you can have a real conversation after that. But until and if they can't give you examples, then you're they're gonna have to go home and do their homework, essentially. <laughs> yeah, it's not right. it's not actionable otherwise. So what do you do with it? You say thank you for the feedback. I, I got nothing, right? Like I can't do anything with um, I like personality traits. I mean, I'm too sensitive thing. I've been told that my whole life. Oh, cool. Yeah. What, 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 what do we do with it? Right? Like, that's just a part of who I am. But if there's something that I'm doing that isn't working for you, then tell me what it is that happened so that I can address that specific thing. Because then I get to have the choice of saying either that's just who I am or, okay, there's something that I did here that offended you. And maybe it's not, I need to change who I am, but it's, I just, I need to acknowledge you. I need to apologize, whatever that looks yeah. like. And just like you said, taking responsibility. I'm big. You and I have been talking about that a lot, Krista, lately, personal responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. Is owning your own feelings. And that's something you can teach your clients because that is what we do through coaching is we help people own their feelings and be able to speak for themselves and learn the words to express themselves more effectively. And that that's really all that it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for anyone listening, hopefully this helps you now that you can differentiate. I don't know if I said that word, but differentiate <laughs> between safe and constructive feedback versus ineffective feedback. And if you do receive ineffective feedback, now you know how to handle it and, and not how to like absorb it and make yourself wrong but right put it back onto the person make them get specific give you specific examples and if they can't then you know ask them to sit with it and then come back to you with specific examples and then you can have a much more productive conversation from there so uh, okay so just a couple more things and then we'll start to wrap up let's talk about setting boundaries around receiving feedback so Something that I started doing at my retreats, so my first couple of retreats that I led in Florida, and that was before Monica, you and I led retreats together down there, is people would get like so excited that we're attending the retreats and all weekend long, they would be like giving me feedback of like, oh, you should do this next time for your next retreat or you should do more of this or you should do less of this. And like, by the end of the weekend, my head was so overflowing with like, uh, okay, did I just like lead a really sucky retreat because (laughs) everybody's telling me these things that they want next time. And I just didn't like it. And so what I started doing was I would tell people at the beginning of the retreat that, Hey, I know you all are going to have amazing ideas and you may see things that I don't see. So I'm going to have a form for you to fill at the end, out at the end of the retreat where you can share your ideas. Um, but otherwise, you know, please just, and you can tell me, Monica, if this was incorrect, but I say, you know, please like, you know, keep your ideas to yourself, keep your feedback to yourself. And then at the end of the retreat, you can pour it all out into that form and then I'll review the form and, and see where I can implement that. So that's been like one way that I've been setting boundaries around feedback. So I'm curious of your thoughts around that. Yeah, I mean, there's no right or wrong. I think it's whatever works for you. And I think just having a container for feedback is really important. And we do that in training too, when we're leading any kind of training programs is, or at least I try to at the beginning of any session, if it's an hour, if it's a two week long session, whatever it looks like, is giving people information up front, uh, setting that stage of how we're going to handle feedback or how you can share ideas and everything. And we use like a parking lot training where they can go, well, when we were physically training in person more before COVID, it was like you could put a sticky note on the wall for the parking lot. It could be questions, it could be feedback, whatever that is. And and I think that sometimes uh, an immediate place for people to have an option is useful. So Krista, you and I have talked about that recently on 
feedback form that they can go to at any point in time because we all forget things. And so even like for the retreat, you could even tell them like, Hey, I'm going to give them this form. Um, but, but take like some notes and maybe, you know, make stars or highlights or give them some sticky notes or whatever. Anytime they have feedback and they can just jot them down. You can have them put it in one spot or whatever that looks like almost like a suggestion box. And then people get it out of their head quickly. And then they're not trying to rack their brain because we don't remember things after they happen. Most of the time when feedback's fresh, that's why people want to tell you right away because they're like, Oh, I have this great idea. I need to share it right now. And they'll forget it later on. So I think, you know, jogging their memory to be like, Hey, here's some sticky notes write it down, go throw it in this box over there or whatever. Then it's out of sight, out of mind. They get it out of their head and they could come back and be present. And that's useful. It can be in coaching. It can be in group programs, whatever it is, just giving them a method because people want to know where they can be heard. And then you as a coach, making sure that you honor that you're checking in and Uh oh, Monica, are you there? Oh no, we lost her. Can you hear me? Oh, Hello? you're back. Oh, okay. Where did you okay. lose me? Uh, you said that people want to be heard and mm. they can know. Oh, and then you have to know, you have to be checking in on the feedback. Right, right. So letting them know how often you're going to check in. Because we want to have boundaries around, you know, I'm not going to check your feedback every single day, but is it once a week? Is it once per quarter? Whatever that looks like, depending on the relationship you have with someone, how often are you going to be checking that? And just reminding them of that over time, because people forget, you can tell them at the beginning of a program, this is how we're going to do it. But I think there's some statistic and I don't know what the source is or if this is just hearsay, but there's some statistic that says you have to hear something seven times before you commit it to memory. And probably for some of us more than that, <laughs> but just continuing to gently remind people like, cool, great idea. Hey, can you go throw that on the feedback form real quick? And remember, I check those once a week or once a month or whatever it is. That's really useful just to remind people that I will be heard. And, and then, you know, however you want to sum that up, if it's checking base with them one-on-one -on -one, or if it's like, I do a quarterly check-in in my six month, training program or whatever it is to just say, Hey, I've heard all of these ideas. Here's what I'm implementing. Here are some things that um, are great, but maybe for later or whatever, just giving like a summary. There's a lot of different ways to do it. There's no right or wrong way, but I think just having a container for people to know that they can get feedback and then reminding them that you're going to do something with it because you know, the old suggestion box, <laughs> that we all have been familiar with in the past. I never fill out suggestion box most places because I don't think anything's going to happen to the information that's there. So at least knowing something's going to happen can help people be more likely to give you that feedback too. And then you can read it on your own time too, which is great for those of us who need to process it more. Yeah, you're right. I so forgot about the, like having your container, but then also having an option where people can, submit it or share it at any time as well, because you're right. Like sometimes you forget. And that's what I saw actually happen with the second coach training class for, so for my first coach training class, I had a feedback form that was available for the whole seven month program. And there was a couple of times where it was really useful and it worked. And then I also had a halfway check-in survey as well. And then I do that with one-on-one -on -one clients too. And it both worked great in, um, for the first program. And so I, for the second class, I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take away that feedback form because I have the halfway check-in survey and then I have the exit survey at the end. So I was like, those two surveys will be enough. But I found out that that wasn't enough because, you know, the, the halfway check-in was like three and a half months into the program and people were having like ideas and thoughts before that. So you and I have talked about adding that adding a feedback form back in sooner so where people can submit their ideas before either the exit survey or the halfway check-in survey. Yeah. And just reminding them that it's there too. I mean, I know sometimes feedback's a little scary for us, but inviting it more often too puts people in the right mindset and a more positive mindset. And, and it really just makes it feel like it's more welcoming. Yeah, exactly.
Okay. Well, is there anything else that you want to add or you feel like our listeners should know about giving and receiving feedback before we wrap up today? I think it's mostly important to trust yourself and to trust that generally speaking, you don't have to internalize every single piece of information everyone gives you and that whatever you decide is okay. It's all about the intention you put behind it. And often just giving explanations to people can help them at least understand. You don't owe them an explanation, but it can help your clients feel more validated for giving you feedback, even if it's something that you're not able or or not willing to implement at that point in time. So just trust yourself and know that feedback, you know, it's so cliche to say feedback is a gift, but it really (laughs) is. It's, it's an opportunity to do something different and it's because people care. And really that is one of the most important things that I've learned over time to just see it a little bit differently. That's so good that you don't have to internalize every piece of feedback. I think that's something I'm going to be learning for the rest of my life. (laughs) You and me both. Yeah. And feedback really is a gift and an opportunity. So I think that's such a good note to end on tonight. Definitely. (sighs) Okay. Well, this has been amazing. I've learned even more about feedback. So thank you, Monica. And I really hope that our listeners took away some valuable gems from this episode as well. And that this will serve you in running your, your workshops, your retreats, your one-on-one coaching programs, group coaching programs, and just anywhere else outside of your coaching business, this will apply to. Definitely. Thanks for having me, Krista. Yeah. All right. Have a good night, Monica, and everyone listening on the podcast. Have a good night as well. Bye, everyone. I'm so grateful that our paths have crossed at this time. And if you're ready to up-level your coaching skill set and learn how to confidently coach at the transformational PCC level in order to help your clients get bigger breakthroughs and better results, then join our Born to Coach Training Academy at buildyourlifecoachingbiz.com forward slash certification.